Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition, our play-by-email game against another YouTuber uh, known as XTRG. Uh, this is March 11th of 1942 of our War in the Pacific Let's Play series against XTRG. We are playing as the Allies, and the Japanese have made stunning progress in the South Pacific, taking New Caledonia and other key Southern Pacific Islands, but they're also way behind in other key places like Singapore, which is yet to fall uh, a full month after the historical date. Uh, there is no indication that Bataan will fall anytime soon. They have not yet really invested in Bataan at all. And we're starting it off with some submarine attacks on the Hayosha Maru. Uh, torpedoes are missing up a score. I think there's a hit but no explosion. And uh, the Spearfish is firing more torpedoes. Another hit but no explosion. We get a hit there with our deck gun. More torpedoes miss. Another hit but no explosion. Uh, more torpedoes miss. And uh, yeah, so this... He's firing more torpedoes! How many? Oh my god. More torpedo! Holy shit! He's gonna use his entire complement of Mark 14 torpedoes on this cargo ship and not get a single frickin' hit. Ugh. He'll do some damage with his deck gun, but I doubt he's gonna sink anything with, with the deck gun ammo. Five shell hits. Broke off. Fired a god awful amount of torpedoes that either all missed or all miss or all missed or all malfunctioned. So there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, Martian, I guess. Four hit, but no explosions. Four or five, I think I counted, and then an equal number of uh, of misses as well. So just bad aiming coupled with bad torpedoes. That skipper, you know, Southern, I don't know if I want to give that skipper a new job because at least he was aggressive as hell. Like, that's something that needs to be rewarded. Oh, using the deck gun? Yeah. Well, you know. I, you know, listen, I can't, I can't criticize a, a captain for uh, his torpedoes sucking, right? At least I don't think I can. It's a three-inch deck gun to encourage uh, captains to use their torpedoes. Well, uh, maybe. Um, yeah, but it's been a while since my last stream or my last video. Um, I think it's been like three or four days since I've posted anything on YouTube. You can see here is a fighter sweep over unoccupied or un no cap over Singapore. And that's because we're actually looking at uh, at moving here shortly. And before we uh, put our place up, uh, up, we have to. We had to do a little bit of work, and so we ended up repainting our bedroom or third bedroom, I guess, the uh, the den, the office, whatever it would, whatever you want to call it. And um, so my computer's been basically in storage for almost the last week, as uh, as I frantically paint. Um, so that's kind of why there's been a, a dearth of activity lately. You can see here he is flying some what looks like some Bettys out of Bangkok. So it looks like he's finally using his Air Force North near Rangoon. Holy shit, 66 zeros sweeping over Rangoon. We have a cap. I didn't quite see of how many aircraft. Might have been like 30 or 40 fighters uh, running a cap against him. But you can see he's got 60 zeros sweeping over Rangoon, an offensive air operation out of Bangkok. You can see here those zeros are um, coming in here. We've got Hurricanes, we've got Warhawks, we've got H-81 P-40B variants uh, engaging Japanese zeros here, damaging Japanese zeros. We, in our last turn, we, he did, XTRG, I guess before he ordered this, this sweep, did allow us, oh yeah, we're diving on him for 35,000! Um, he did allow us to, or it was kind of his suggestion, I feel like, but he was kind of asking for clarification on our altitude rules. And one of the things that we agreed on was that, you know, f as far as house rules are concerned, we agreed to drop the house rule that minimize, that, that locks aircraft in to one maneuver band above their maximum maneuver band. That house rule, more than anything, is just for sort of, I think, is primarily for... Um, I don't know if realism is the right word, but to prevent aircraft from flying at like 35,000 feet all the time when they really didn't. Um, but by removing that rule, it does give the Zeros some benefits against some of our aircraft, like some of our P-40s or some of our Buffaloes, which can't, and Buffaloes really can't fly that high at all. But it gives us an advantage with aircraft like the uh, Hurricane 2B Trope, because that actually has a higher ceiling 
than any of the Japanese Zeros. Uh, so that's kind of cool. So the, the, the Hurricane is diving on them. Meanwhile, we're flying other aircraft like the P-40s at around 20,000 feet. The P-39s, I think, are at around 15,000. We're deliberately flying those much lower in the hope that we'll lure the Zeros down from whatever their high sweeping altitude is and give us a chance, even better chance, to engage the Zero at uh, favorable altitudes. Also, my understanding is the Hurricane also has better high altitude performance, not just higher ceiling, but overall better high altitude performance than the Zero. So this is sort of our golden ticket, if you will, the, the Hurricanes at high altitudes against the Zeros. Um, and then obviously the P-40s, while they don't match well from a maneuverability perspective against the Zeros, they do do a pretty good job uh, against the Zeros in terms of being able to take damage. So you can see here we're actually inflicting quite a few casualties on the uh, zeros. Now, we're, we're definitely suffering some our, ourselves. Our Blenheims got hit real hard. We lost at least one of our Flying Tigers there, uh, and uh, looks like uh, some of his aircraft are withdrawing due to low, low uh, not fuel, low ammo. Uh, he is inflicting some damage. We've got more Hurricanes coming in. This is a big dogfight, probably the biggest dogfight we've had since the, uh, the, the cap trap of our... Um, of our, what do you call it, our, our carrier craft at Singapore. I know the Blenheim's a night fighter, but it, again, it's more of a two-engine diversion than anything. It's it's not trying to beat the Zero per se. It's trying to draw it down to lower altitudes. It's trying to occupy it while other aircraft come in. Um, yeah, they're meat shields for the Hurricanes. Exactly, Sean Mac. Um, he's sweeping. I don't know if the Bettys are coming or not. I guess we'll see. Um... All right, so now Zeros are diving on our Warhawks. That's not great. Some of them are evading. Let's go ahead and fast forward through this anyway. So a lot of action there. 37 aircraft made it through to Rangoon. You can see here the total number of aircraft engaged. 66 Japanese Zeros, 5 of the H-81 Flying Tiger P-40s, 5 Blenheim IFs, 13 Hurricane Trops, 16 Air Cobras, 18 Warhawks. So that's 34, 47, 52, 57 aircraft versus 66. You can see here we lost three Air Cobras and Warhawks each, one Blenheim and one H-81. We didn't lose any Hurricanes, which is great. Uh, total of eight aircraft versus five zeros. So just shy of two to one advantage in numbers based on that combat report. We'll have to see what the actual intelligence screen shows us though, because that's very much influenced by fog of war. More fighter sweeps over Singapore. So he's definitely got at least two or three more squadrons of Oscars by the looks of it that he could he could bring in to Bangkok if he wants to use those against uh, Rangoon as well. So he might have 66, um, 66 zeros sweeping over Rangoon, but I'm sure he can bring another 80 or so Oscars. He could probably, based off of what we're seeing sweeping over Singapore, based on what we're seeing in our intelligence out of out of uh, Bangkok, I would guess he could pretty easy, easily bring in 150 to 180 Japanese fighters over Rangoon to suppress that base. It's pretty much inevitable that at some point he's going to get air superiority over the base. It looks like he's already got one squadron uh, based north here coming out of Bangkok with some Oscar escorts. Uh, but the hope is that we can bloody him and inflict a lot of, of pilot losses and casualties on his airframes that might hinder his ability to operate elsewhere. Meanwhile, it's a small Betty raid. Um, just three Bettys are coming in. He really seems hesitant to launch large-scale bombing raids ever since Singapore. Uh, the entire operation in Java so far, he's basically only been sending one fragment of a bomber unit over uh, Surabaya. Uh, wow, well, you just tripped over that name again. Um, but he's basically only been sending like a small fragment of, of bombers over there every time. The intent seems to be to lure Cap up and shoot the aircraft down in the sky without actually risking any bombers or anything like that. So we'll see. We'll go ahead and fast forward through here. You can see a few Oscars sweeping there. Looks like it's a naval strike here against some cargo ships here that are in Rangoon's port. Uh, so you can see one of the baddies put a torpedo into the side of the cargo ship Dilga. Damaged engines. Um, you can see here there were eight Oscars escorting three baddies. We damaged two baddies, destroyed one Oscar. We lost one P-40. Heavy damage to that cargo ship. All right, so that cargo ship that was hit by a torpedo sank. So we lost our first cargo ship on our supply missions to uh, Rangoon. Meanwhile, another uh, raid here just off the coast of Rangoon, not over Rangoon itself, so there's no fighter support for those ships. You can see uh, a torpedo into the side of the Triest. Three more Bettys coming in. 
a lot of torpedoes coming into the side of the Triste. So it sinks. So we lose two cargo ships there. I think my P-39s are flying low altitude cap. I think they're at like 15,000, which if they're really coming at it 12, I don't think he's actually ordering them to fly at 200. I think they dive down to 200 when they come in for the torpedo attack. I only have four buffaloes active at Blair right now anyway, uh, Southern, so I'm not sure that's the right strategy. We'll have to see. All right, so pretty active turn in the air operations phase anyway. You could see a lot of action occurring over uh, Rangoon and off the coast of Rangoon. We'll have to see what our, uh, what our um, ready aircraft are following the, those pretty big air battles over Rangoon. Uh, we'll have to also see how our shipping looks. If we really only lose tar two cargo ships, it's not the end of the world. Looks like he's bombarding at Singapore here. We'll fast forward through that. Um, shouldn't get a meaningful result off of a bombardment there. Um, 155 Allied casualties. That's actually kind of heavy. 14 squads, 2 destroyed, 12 disabled. That was a rough bombardment. He did have 6 guns, 1 disabled, 1 destroyed. But, uh, yeah, that was a pretty effective Japanese bombardment there. Japanese deliberate attack here northeast of Quilin. You can see here he's got three divisions in place, three solid divisions, the 6th, 110th, and 32nd, along with an army headquarters unit. We just have a single core in place. Get one-to-one -one assault odds. You can see here he has 1,300 assault value versus 313 defending, but it is a times three defensive hex. So his assault value drops to 538, which seems like a pretty favorable roll for him. The defense value only increases to 466, so it gets a one-to-one -one result. Japanese lose 1,500 men, eight squads destroyed, 153 disabled. We lose 522 men, two destroyed, 60 disabled. So that actually favors us quite a bit. 161 at least temporarily destroyed or disabled for him versus only 62 for us. Uh, that's better than a 2-to-1 advantage, approaching 3-to-1 advantage there. We lose one non-combatant disabled, three engineers disabled. He loses 10 guns, 26 engineers disabled. That's a good result for us. I'm, I'm happy with that. Japanese deliberate attack at Nanyang. That is not what I wanted to see. This is an open terrain, so this could be rough. Three more Japanese divisions attacking here, about 1,200 assault value. Uh, hey, Darth Gnome, good to see you. Um, okay. So we'll see what happens here. Japanese capture the fort, or the base. Our troops are retreating back. Base force lost. Oh, second group army headquarters unit is destroyed. That's not good. He gets four to one assault odds. We had no fortifications there. That's a bad turn. 17,393 casualties, 413 units destroyed, 222 disabled. 676 non-combatant squads, 102 engineers, 75 guns, all lost. Five units retreating, one destroyed. Uh, only 2,600 Japanese casualties, 248 disabled, 11 destroyed. That's a bad day in China. Um... Nope, they retreated the right direction, Southern. They can't retreat to the hex north of Nanyang because there's a Japanese uh, force there, or at least there was last turn. We Remember, we still had like 600 assault value to the southwest of Nanyang, so they actually retreated to an area where we have some reinforcements. Um, so that should counter the majority of our losses there. We had just shy of 1,000 assault value there on the defensive God, an open terrain allied adjusted defense drops to 240. So we'll just pull those guys back west into the mountains, and that should that should help. Meanwhile, another Japanese deliberate attack, this one at Kayagan on Mindanao. We're very low on supplies here, so we'll see if we can hold out. And we do. We get one to two assault odds on... Or Japanese get one to two assault odds. They lose 806 more men, 11 disabled, 67... Or sorry, 67 disabled, 11 destroyed. We lose 27 destroyed and 35 disabled, but... Uh, I still call that a victory. Another day, another uh, hold of serve there. We don't even get the defender cat penalty for low supply there. So fort level stays at two, doesn't get reduced. One to two assault odds. Japanese lose more men in theory. Um, in terms of destroyed, I think that actually favors us. I'd have to go back and double check. But from a victory point perspective, any, any casualties we can inflict in Mindanao in March is, is a big win for us there. Uh, Batan is still quiet. I believe he still has two divisions there. Meanwhile, we're bombarding the 2nd Independent Mixed Brigade northeast 
uh, China, uh, southeast of Siam. So you can see, obviously, we just fought this battle around Nanning. He's got a small force in the mountains to the east of Siam. I'm just bombarding there mainly. Oh, looks like we destroyed his squad, which is nice. But I don't, I don't see the point in attacking here. This is times three defensive terrain. He has a brigade. We have almost a thousand assault values, so we've got about four to one advantage there. However, the terrain instantly cuts that four to one down because it gives a times three defensive advantage. So that would be very bloody. We might be able to push him out, but I don't think it's worth the cost in manpower. I think the best bet is just to kind of continue holding here. I am bringing about 600 more assault value into the hex. And then once they arrive, if he hasn't reinforced, at that point we might attack. But we don't have a big enough advantage in terms of assault value here to have an efficient attack. And I don't think driving him back 46 miles at the expense of wrecking the wrecking those three or four cores of mine there is is a very good result. Or, or would be a very good result. Another Japanese bombardment attack at Ambon. And that looks like that's about the turn. So that's uh, Suva, builds fortification size 4. That's good to see. Townsville up to 3. So a couple of bases improve their fortifications. That's a very active turn. We had um, a major air battle over Rangoon. We had two, I, I would say, two major land battles in China. One did not go our way, one went our way. And then we had another important land battle at Mindanao. So a lot of land combat. Uh, and don't forget the Mark 14 kerfuffle of uh, four or five hit but no explosions, an equal number of misses, a submarine skipper basically wasting his entire torpedo loadout on a small Japanese freighter. Um, so there's that. Looks like we lose one victory point in China due to partisan attacks. All right, first things first, let's check out the intelligence report. So the intelligence report is saying the Allies lost 13 aircraft in air-to-air -air combat today. The Japanese lost 15. We also lost five ops losses. They lost three. So that actually favors us slightly. So even with those heavy air battles over Rangoon, this is claiming, and no, obviously this is influenced by fog of war, so who knows how accurate it is. But the Japanese lose 19 aircraft to R-18. It's saying the Japanese lost 13 zeros, which is actually quite a few. If we really shot down 13 enemy zeros, I'm very happy with that. We did lose seven Warhawks. That's kind of a large number of Warhawks, but it is what it is. We lost five Aero Cobras, uh, four of them air-to-air, -air, one operational losses. So these air, all, air losses would all be over Rangoon. I think the same is true for his zeros, though, too. So just between those two groups, 13 to 12, I will take a one-to-one -one trade with Japanese zeros every day of the week. Uh, we also shot down two Oscars in air-to-air -air combat over Rangoon. We lost two Blenheim IFs, one air-to-air, -air, one op loss. Um, and then we lost two of the Flying Tigers H81A3s, one air loss, one ops. So the actual operations over, uh, and it looks like we also lost one hurricane operationally, so maybe it was damaged or so and crashed on landing. Still, even though that gives him maybe like a, a I don't know, 15 to, to 17 or so uh, advantage over just the Rangoon section, uh, that is that is a good um, result for us. 13 is way too high. Cut the number by half if I'm lucky. I don't know. I, I don't think... I would guess that those numbers are not dramatically far off. We'll see. Um, but I I think it's... I would guess we got like 8 or 9. Here's the thing. It's calling it's calling 13 air-to-air. -air. That might be high, right? Maybe it's 6 or 7. But then you also factor some of those air-to-air -air claims also turn into operational losses as well. So even if the air-to-air -air losses are only six or seven, you probably have another three to four operational losses that are that are written off when they land. So I think the total number of airframes that he lost is about the same. Okay. Okay. So in terms of pilot losses, we only lost two aircraft, two pilots killed in action. Uh, so that's a good result for us. Only two KIA, five wounded in action. Not really sure if any of the guys we lost were aces or not. I, it doesn't tell me when some of these guys are killed. So, like, I don't know when Obert was killed. I don't know when Mott was killed. I don't know when Brown... Brownwell, I know, was already dead. And I think T. Cole has been dead for a little while as well. But we lost a couple of... Uh, we lost two more pilots this turn, KIA. How long does it take to be sure about air losses, Stein? I'm not sure. I assume it's the same as ship losses where it can take like up to 90 days or 180 days or something. 
So we did lose two ships last turn. We lost the Triest and the Dilga. Both are somewhat less valuable cargo ships. Nine victory points and seven. So 16 victory points there. Uh, if we look at the victory point screen, the Japanese are marching closer to even. Uh, remember, they need three to one odds to win at the end of the year. Uh, but right now they're at 9,800 versus 10,800 for us. That's going to get a big swing when places like Singapore and Bataan fall. He's going to get a lot of victory points for destroying all those units. Um, but I don't think it's going to be anywhere near. To, it won't be close enough to be to to be three to one. But just to give you an example, just the base itself, Singapore is worth 1,800 victory points for us, 420 for the Japanese. So I'm assuming that's like a 2,200 point swing for Singapore plus the casualties he inflicts. Uh, Bataan's not worth that much from a victory point perspective, so that's not not bad. Um, so if we go up to Rangoon, you can see here we take a look at our at our fighter aircraft. We have 87 aircraft still, so I think we had around 100 before this turn. So 87 aircraft, only 57 of them are ready. We have quite a few that are uh, not ready. They're they're maintenance, they're repair, they're damaged. Um, so you can see here the 24th Pursuit Group, 21st Squadron, and 20th Squadron both have four aircraft down for repair. The 17th has 11, but I actually think a bunch of those 11 are not damaged from the last fight. If you remember, I think I ordered like eight replacement aircraft because this unit was below full strength of 25 aircraft. So you can actually see that three of the aircraft were damaged last turn and are repairing. The other... Eight or so of them that are damaged are actually maintenance, just routine maintenance. Uh, that's required sometimes when you bring new aircraft in from a replacement pool. Um, it looks like we're actually going to get a large number of these aircraft back tomorrow. About five of them will be ready tomorrow. Another two will be ready two days from now. So we should get about seven of those back in the next two days. Um, okay. Yeah, Pat, he hasn't destroyed much of the U.S. Navy at all yet, so that's good. The Blenheim Squadron is absolutely ravaged, so that's not great. Super tempting to grab some Sea Hurricanes and throw those into uh, into Rangoon, but probably won't do that. These guys actually have to be removed by June 1st anyway. and look like I can withdraw them right now, but interesting that I can't disband them either. Uh, meanwhile, the AVG number one squadron only has three airframes left. Uh, I don't even think we get any more AVG replacements from aircraft. I am thinking that maybe once we get up to 27 of these P-38 Lightnings that we might give this group P-38 Lightnings. So we should be getting more of those aircraft in the next seven days or so. I could pull the small group out. They're very experienced pilots to a large degree. We've got Boeington at 84. We've got Smith at 80. We've got uh, Foshi, uh, Robert, Gibbons, uh, Morrissey, Neil. Look at all these guys. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pilots, all with 70-plus experience. It would be great. Uh, to uh, give these guys P-38s. Can't do it quite yet. It won't let me. I don't Either I don't have enough aircraft or, or whatnot, um, but that would be great to have uh, P-38s uh, in, in Rangoon. We've got 14 ready currently in the pool. I also did replace, I think it was our last P-38 squadron over here. Uh, where are they? Yeah, the 14th Pursuit Group. Um, 48th Pursuit Squadron. These guys had nine P-38s. I swapped them out for 25 obsolete Mohawks. So that means that we'll get nine more into the pools, which will be great. Uh, Southern, we can try to hold Rangoon, but I don't think so. I don't think we'll hold Rangoon, but I also don't intend to retreat all my troops into Rangoon either. Also, apparently I have uh, the 26th Pursuit Squadron here. It's unrestricted, so I really should get these 25 P-40s out of there and uh, toward the front. Also, the other nice thing is right now, because we had to withdraw a bunch of P-40 groups, uh, despite losing heavy air uh, losses last turn, if we filter out everything but the U.S. and we take a look at what's in pool, we actually see here that we've got um, 25 Air Cobras in pool, so we lost like five of those, but we've got 25 in pool, so we've got a good number of aircraft in reserve. We've got 22 P-40Es in reserve as well. So we've got a pretty good situation right now with our P-40s and P-35s that can take casualties in the Rangoon area to keep taking those losses and casualties. We just have to make sure that what we do is we don't commit the Air Force to battles where we aren't at near full strength. So that's why I'm kind of debating at the at this turn to just sit the entire force. 
he has not been super aggressive at um, making uh, attacks with large numbers of bombers. It seems he would much rather sweep with fighters instead. So I'm kind of debating just leaving the uh, leaving the aircraft on the ground this turn. We should be back to like s almost 70 ready aircraft next turn. Uh, and then I can also bring in other aircraft from Pegu. I've got 14 ready hurricanes in Pegu. Uh, two more are going to be ready tomorrow. So we'll have 16 hurricanes in Pegu tomorrow. I've also got 10 hurricanes up here at Milta. I've got another 16 hurricanes up here at Mandalay. So between those all, I can bring another 30-some-odd aircraft into Rangoon. Once we get those repaired aircraft, we'll be back to around 100 aircraft, and the quality of those aircraft is going to be even greater because we're going to be going from, like, what did I have here, Flying Cap? I had one group of 16 Hurricanes Flying Cap last turn. Now I'll have, you know, 40-plus Hurricanes Flying Cap over Rangoon, uh, and those, those work out pretty well against the Zero. Uh, Brass Monkey, thanks for the sub. Appreciate it. I don't think we lost Morsby yet. Morsby's still in theory holding Sean Mack. So he hasn't attacked there yet. Supplies are low. There's only 20 supplies. I've been ferrying supplies in with some air aircraft off of the Australian continent. So we've gotten our supply situation for the most part back to acceptable. Um, there's not really any in reserve, which is not good. But at least in theory, the supply situation in Moresby is okay. Now, that does mean some bad things. The runway damage and service damage has been dropping from the 90s and 80s down to 80s and 60s. So our engineers, now that they have a little bit of supply, are repairing the base a little bit. I don't like that, but it, I can't control it either. Um, so we'll see what happens there. So Moresby is still in theory uh, ours. Yeah, Sean, I, there's no way to hold it, so we will lose Moresby. That'll suck, but it's also, like, it's kind of isolated. I know Moresby historically was this important thing because it helped shut down the Coral Sea and it gives the Japanese, uh, it brings, like, places like Karens and Townsville into range of Japanese uh, Nels and Bettys. So, like, Townsville is 14 away, uh, Charterstown even. But uh, those are long-range strikes that, like, if he was trying to hit Charterstown, he, he could, in theory, hit it with the G3Ms, but he'd have no way to escort aircraft out to four, 15 hexes. Townsville, I think the Zero can get it to 14 on absolute max range, but that is just going to kill him in terms of ops losses. So it helps him shut down the Northern Taurus Strait, but realistically, the Taurus Strait's already shut down with aircraft off Rabal and Timor. Uh, so at the end of the day, it does give him a better hold if he wants to ferry sh uh, ships and troops across into northern Australia, which is certainly a concern at some point for a, a Japanese invasion of Australia. But uh, at least in the immediate term, I'm not too worried about that. Uh, same could be true of New Caledonia. He's already got aircraft that are, you know, within striking distance of Brisbane. Uh, you can see here, nine, well, actually, no, they're not. They're 19 out, so they can't hit from there. But, um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's, it'll suck to lose Moresby. Moresby is worth 320 victory points to the Japanese, so that'll give him a good, good boost there, but it's not the end of the world. Um, he's also sending some shipping west, northwest, it looks like here, some PT boats and patrol boats. Not sure quite where they're moving to. Palembang, he's got a, he's got a force ashore at Palembang. We have about only 59 assault value left at that, that base there, so that's not great. The fortification levels here are is down to one, so again, that's not great. We do have one battalion that's trying to march there really quick. They're 90 or 86 miles away. Uh, we'll see if we can get them into reinforced Palembang or not. If they can get there, it'll give a nice little reinforcement of about 36 assault value, um, but, uh, but we'll see. Uh, Martinian victory condition for Japan. Japan, basically the game measures victory and victory points. So right now the Allies have 10,896 victory points. The Japanese have 9,835. For the Japanese to win by the end of... Uh, for the Japanese to win, they have to get three times the Allied victory points in 1942. So they have to have three times more than we have. They're nowhere close to that. Those numbers are going to flip when places like Singapore, Bataan, Palembang all fall. But... Um, at least right now, anyway, they're nowhere near that. So by the end of the year, they have to have three times what we have. If they don't win in 42, they can win in 43 if they have two times what we have. 
I don't know exactly. I mean, it's a complex situation, right? Like, I don't know exactly what they all uh, need to take. There's a couple of routes they can go. They can go for an invasion of uh, of India. They can go for an invasion of Australia. Theoretically, they might even be able to go for an invasion of New Zealand. I think if they take any one of those bases in its entirety, uh, they could win. Uh, but they also need to do things like sinking ships, which they haven't done a lot of. Uh, last turn, we did lose a couple of cargo ships. But if we look at, like, since the war has begun, the largest ship that the Allies have lost so far is the heavy cruiser Houston. Um, this is wildly inaccurate. We've seen the Fuso since, which I don't get why that hasn't updated it yet. It's been almost 60 days since this claim. The Congo, it's been even longer. It's been almost, it's been 90 days since the Congo claim. The Congo is not sunk. We did put a 500-pound bomb into it, but it's not sunk. But the Congo and Fuso are definitely both alive. Uh, the Haruna is sunk. We did see that sink in the Battle of Marsing. So we did sink one of his capital ships. He has not sunk anything larger than a heavy cruiser. He has done a fair number, amount of damage to some of our transports. The President Coolidge was sunk. We've lost a couple of APs that are moderately valuable. But he's also lost three or four light cruisers as well. So overall, it's not, uh, it's not huge. Um... All right, so let's go take a look at Cape Town. Take a look at the ships repairing there. The Prince of Wales and the Repulse both still chugging along. The Pr Repulse is about 57 days from being repaired. Um, so that's good to see. Seven more days on the Gertrude. Um, some shipping has arrived from the eastern United States with some fuel. So we're unloading... I don't know why they're not unloading, but they should be unloading. I guess they both must have just arrived. Cape Town, Eastern U.S. Well, no, you just literally got here. You should be... Why is it loading? It's weird. Well, they're both loading. I don't understand that. That's weird. Okay, so I will have sports coming out of my ears in time. Sports? Uh, okay, 66,000 fuel is currently at Cape Town. We're going to unload another 20,000 or so here this turn or next turn. So I'll get cl back close to around 100,000 fuel, just shy of it. Um, I'm not sure what to do with Rangoon here. So I've got... 21,000 supply in the port. He started hitting it with Betty's. He did a fair amount of damage last turn, sinking two ships. These guys are already in port, so I'm going to let them do stay docked and unload 21,000 more supply. I could turn this task force around. It's three turns from being, or three hexes from being in port with another 40,000 supply. But again, if he's going to keep hitting us with, uh, with Betty's, that could be an expensive proposition. Uh, we have 56,000 supplies in Rangoon, so it's more than enough. Um... This group is already withdrawing here. You can see that's obviously why they're diverting north is to stay out of range of his uh, shipping or his aircraft. They're not even detected right now. So these guys are pulling out. Um, well, Pat, these guys will get in during night phase, but I'm debating standing down my entire fighter force over Rangoon next turn. The reason is I don't want to send 50 fighters up to get completely shredded by Japanese Zeros uh, due to fatigue and not having enough airframes. So my thought is to wait one turn with everybody stood down, get us back to around 70 ready aircraft, uh, then bring in another 30 fighters from other bases in Burma so that we have around 100 frontline fighters in Burma and then contest them again at that point. commit all the aircraft in the area to give them a bloody nose and that should give them time to drop the supply. The problem is getting the aircraft ready. Like I've already suffered. He basically attacked one turn too early. I started flooding aircraft into Burma, but they're not all into Rangoon yet. And I think if I transfer them close to Rangoon, then they're going to suffer some attrition problems and they're going to suffer some ops losses and some fatigue. So I really need a day off. I feel before we attack again. Now we could rush these guys back North during the day phase and try and get them out of range and then wait out of range and then maybe come South. Um, once we're ready to contest his, his aircraft again. I mean, that's another option. Uh, 
Uh, yes, Sean Mack, the Hornet is moving to Panama. I'll have to think about that. I'm not sure what to do there yet. Um, I could give these Buffaloes Mohawks. Not sure what my plan is for my carriers right now, uh, Fomal. We did have a very long uh, cap trap at Singapore. So we've got five carriers, including the British Indomitable, currently south of Australia, swinging back east toward Melbourne. Uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, potentially something in the Coral Sea. I don't know. We'll have to see. I don't know where his carriers are. The last we saw of his fleet carriers is they were off east over here. Uh, near Palmyra and Christmas Island two or three days ago. We haven't seen them since, so they're obviously, I mean, presumably they're moving west now. Um, we've got mine layers on the... Oh, wait, did these guys already lay their mines? They did. All right, so we now have laid a minefield at Palmyra, and they're on their way back to Pearl Harbor. So now we have 297 mines at Palmyra. We have th 414 mines at Christmas Island, so that's good. Fiji B-17s, are they ready to go back up yet? Let's take a look. I don't think so. Um, I've also pulled some of them out. So they're ready. their readiness is getting better. They still have a couple of aircraft that are still down for repairs. So they're up to 11 ready aircraft out of 16. I've actually pulled some of them out to Australia. I'm trying to remember where in Australia. I think I sent a bunch of them to... Charter Towns. So you can see here we have 24 B-17s at Charter Towns. 17 of those are ready. Uh, you've got three and three that are both currently uh, undergoing maintenance. All that looks like three of the, all three of those will be ready tomorrow. So all of the aircraft, all 24, will be ready in the next few days. Do I have any other B-17s there? I can't remember. Yeah, I think that's it. So we've got the 24 at Charters Towns, and then we've got the 11 or so back on uh, on Fiji. Um, good call, Co. I could I could definitely stand the uh, task forces down. That's not a terrible idea. Do you remember where in Canada? Uh, there's the Winnipeg Grenadiers Battalion, which I think was just reformed this turn. Definitely looks like it anyway. So these guys were destroyed somewhere. Might have been Hong Kong or something like that. But uh, I, I purchased them back. So they just reformed, but they're obviously nowhere near ready. Rifles Canada Battalion is in a similar situation. It was reformed. Um, I probably should turn the replacements off till we're ready to, to fully reform them as well. That was a couple turns ago, I think. Our Fusiliers. Yeah, I think it was just those those troops I was looking at in uh, in Victoria or in uh, Vancouver. Okay, load fuel, full speed. Keep down. All right, so we'll move them there. Meanwhile, the Hornet is on its way to Panama. So the Hornet is already just two days out. So we're flank speeding the Hornet, which just arrived in theater from the U.S. East Coast to Panama. So they've got uh, they've gotten one day into their, their move. They're two days from arriving at base. I need more fighter aircraft on these, uh, these carriers. We've got 15 F4, F4s in reserve. That should be more than enough to outfit these guys fully. Meanwhile, I'll have an ASW group here, two destroyers waiting for the carrier to arrive. So actually I'll put these guys into port and then in two days when they arrive, hopefully those guys will have repaired their minor amounts of damage. Yep, one day, four days really. Well, I can't even fully repair because it's got engine damage that needs to go into a shipyard. I don't have any shipyards there, so we won't do that. Uh, but in any event, so we've got two destroyers waiting to uh, receive the Hornet when it arrives at Panama in two days. 
Uh, any more mounted police taking all the regular Canadian infantry? I don't think so. All right. Um, so that's the situation there. We're also going to mine Johnston Island, which I think has a small number of mines, 276. Do we already mine it? Yep. So we mine Johnston Island. We mined Palmyra. Both of those have 250 plus. Christmas Island is also mined with over 400 mines. So the uh, Line Islands and Johnston Island are all mined now, should he decide to return with bombardment task forces or carriers or anything like that. Um, we saw Suva expanded its fortifications to level 4, so that's good to see. They're now working toward level 5 fortifications, which is very important as we learned when his battleships nuked uh, nuke Port Moresby, we need to make sure that he can't quite so easily destroy us. I believe fortifications hinder how effective surface bombardments can be. Vavu is working on getting its airfield to level 1. It's at 77%. It's probably 4 or 5 days till it's level 1, but then it can act as a ferry between the two bases. Uh, meanwhile, Tongatapu in the south here it just started building its airfield also to act as a shuttle. Uh, so it's working on that, although we still have troops unloading over the beach here. 1,700 equipment, 1,300 supplies still unloading at Tongatapu. Raoul Island, meanwhile, has a very small number of the 2nd RNZAF, uh, Royal New, New Zealand uh, Base Force. Uh, it's unloaded three Bofors, 11 aviation support, two militia, two or three engineers, one's dis uh, disabled, uh, and three support. We still have another... Uh, 1,100 troops and 900 equipment, as well as 1,000 supply to unload at this dot base at Raoul. But we have ordered them to start working on the airfield to turn that dot base into a real base. Uh, I'm a real base! Uh, but it's going to take a while. It's only at 1%, mainly because not all the engineers are unloaded yet. Um, so hopefully that'll go a little bit quicker as they as they do unload. Canada Ba uh, Bao was not very involved. I think Canada's really only major operation in the Pacific War um, other than maybe some some convoy actions and some stuff around Alaska, was probably, I think they had a battalion or two of troops at Hong Kong, uh, which fell early in the war. But I don't think they had much in the way of troops anywhere in the Pacific outside of, uh, outside of Hong Kong and maybe some of the operations around uh, Atu and Kiska in, in Alaska. That doesn't mean I can't use them, though. We've got several flower corvettes, which we've been using as escorts in the Pacific, uh, and we also have a brigade of Canadian troops on the line on the line island. So I was talking to you uh, just a minute ago about Christmas Island, I think it is. And I have uh, brought in the 13th Canadian Brigade, uh, which is our primary defensive force here on, on Christmas Island. Granted, they're militia, so they're not the best troops. But, uh, you know, when he recons the base, he'll still see uh, those troops there regardless. There's, you know, over 1,200 infantry there, about 3,000 total troops uh, that are Canadians there. Um, okay. Uh, Win old gamer, by the way, thanks for the follow. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure there's a ton else to show. I guess the Chinese theater, we should look at that because we, there was a lot going on last turn there. So you can see here the defense Northeast of Quilin, this, uh, core, had around 300 assault value. It dropped down to 261 after that attack. It was one-to-one -one assault odds, so they weren't super favorable to us. They still have 261 assault value left. They also have reinforcements coming on, so we've got 208 assault value coming in in the form of the 6th Chinese Corps. They should arrive tomorrow. They just were one mile away from participating in that battle, so probably a good thing I switched them into combat mode because they would have been hit in... Uh, in March mode in that last battle if I had moved them in, which, is, which would not be favorable to us. So we've got 208 more assault value about to arrive. That'll bring us up from 261 to around uh, just shy of 500, uh, 469, I guess. Uh, and then again, the times three defensive terrain bonus here should hopefully help us hold out the troops that we saw here, the four enemy units here uh, just east of Quilin. All of this rail line south toward Quilin is rough terrain for an attacker. So it should hopefully allow us to delay him. We've also got a single core in front of Quilin on the very poor roadway here. Uh, only 128 there, but again, good defensive terrain. So we'd have to send more than a full division this way as well uh, from Wuchou or Canton uh, to overwhelm us. Quilin itself is relatively lightly defended right now. We've just got the second prov uh, provisional uh, Chinese core here, a little bit of infantry, not very much support. Uh, but we have a bunch of troops on the way. So just north here, we've got three full Chinese corps, over a thousand assault value, which I am marching south down bad roads. So they've got to get through three hexes, four hexes to get to Quilin. That's probably going to take a week or two. 
Um, but uh, if we can if we can hold them up here, then these reinforcements might be able to arrive. Quilin itself is a times three defensive terrain, uh, or sorry, times two defensive terrain, but it's also got level three forts, so that's good. That should help there. Meanwhile, we've got a bunch of more reinforcements coming down the rail line north here. Uh, we have started pulling troops out of Chikikang. Chikikang is about to get to level four fortifications at 99% toward level four. Um, we've still got... Uh, nope, wrong base. We've still got... Uh, 4,300 assault value here, uh, although I have slowly been withdrawing these guys just because it doesn't make a lot of sense, especially since this times three defensive terrain. It'll be level four fortifications. I'm not sure it makes a ton of sense uh, to leave a huge force there behind that river. Uh, we have moved some of those troops to the northeast. These guys are in open terrain, or actually uh, defensive terrain, and the troops are digging in, so these guys are up to level two forts, uh, also with times three defensive terrain to the northeast on the direct road to Chongqing. Meanwhile, looks like he's bringing up another unit here east of Cyan, but I'm pretty confident in my ability to hold these guys. Uh, they they outnumber the enemy four to one in terms of assault value here, and they're in times three defensive terrain. So even if it brings a full division in here, I don't think he can push me back. Uh, these troops are looking like they're in level one fortifications. The experience for Chinese troops, 50, that's not bad. Morale is very good at night in the 90s. So those guys, I think, are, are, are okay. Um... Uh, we also have these troops south of Cyan, which are, I think, starting to dig in. So, yeah, you can see level one forts for some of these troops. We've got about 1,500 assault value south of Cyan, also in very good defensive terrain down here. So with two hexes in front of the base, Cyan itself is in open terrain, so that's not good. But it does have level three forts working on level four. Uh, and then the troops in Nanyang, which were pushed southwest back, did rejoin some other troops that were already here. It looks like the 7th, 12th, and 29th Chinese corps were already located here uh, with about 400, and f well, about 500 assault value here, uh, plus the 600 or so that the troops that retreated left had. So we are, we're back up to 1,100 assault value. I don't intend to hold here. This is clear terrain as well, so I have no desire to hold here. I've ordered these guys to move and pull back. Unfortunately, the 13th Corps was kind of shattered. I can't issue orders. Every single one of the rifle squads is disabled. These guys are probably going to get destroyed at the end of the day. But I am going to pull the rest of those troops back, the 1,100 or so assault value back. We're going to pull them back two hexes into the mountains west of Nanning. We've got to cross this river into this clear terrain, then we'll move west here as well. Um, and that's the that's the objective. It does, he does have some troops pursuing by the looks of it. So he might beat us there. He might defeat us in open field. Uh, we'll have to see. But um, hopefully not. Uh, hopefully the, the, the move orders get us out of there in time. If he does bomb us, though, that could slow us down. So we'll see. No, we're not retreating to Yichang. Yichang is cut off. We're just retreating north into these mountains, north toward uh, Ankang. So we're retreating. We'll probably pull back to roughly here. Um the main, you know, honestly, even with that big defeat at Nanning, I think the the mission was achieved. Our troops are back here within a hex of Cyan. He was located here. We moved into his rear. That forced him to pull back over 40 miles. That allowed us to push our front line in Cyan forward 40 miles, again, into rough terrain and very defensible terrain. So just that mere fact that we forced him to pull back some 46 miles to buy us an extra hex of breathing room in front of Cyan, that by itself made that entire operation worthwhile. These troops previously were just sitting in the mountains in, in to the west of Nanning, not really doing much. Much. He didn't seem to be pushing north through those mountain those mountain passes. So I think that was a good result for us regardless. Kuming. Um, this base here? I believe so. I know I've, I've ordered someone to move there. They're probably a little far away. Oh, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to move one unit from Kuiyang into Kuming, and then we're going to move the unit in Kuming north to Sinyong to prevent him dropping paratroopers on that base. I think I still have like another seven or eight days before he's allowed to use paratroopers again. Also, as a reminder, he did commit one of his few paratrooper units over here to Port Blair. So his SNLF-3 unit there, he did drop over here. Um, if necessary, I can fly cap over this base for a few turns just to make sure he can't do it easily. But um, yeah, he did drop a, a paratrooper element in here into Port Blair. Which I haven't attacked yet because I don't feel like the RM Viper Force is strong enough to attack there. Um, we we are strong enough to defend because it's jungle terrain, but that works both ways. So if we try and attack, he's got like 20 assault value based on the last battle we saw here. And if I try and attack 20 assault value with 13, 
and it's in jungle terrain, and he gets times three. I'm just going to wreck myself, so I decided not to do it. Meanwhile, troops north of Bangkok here, you can see the uh, 108th base force is probably about to be attacked and driven off this rail line that's hopefully hindering supply south to Singapore. Singapore itself is up to 69% uh, to level 3 fortifications again. So they were at level 3 fortifications two days ago. He launched an attack. He reduced them to level 2. Uh, he hasn't attacked the last two days. I'm guessing hopefully we get a couple more days before he attacks again because I would love to get those fortifications back up to level 3 so that his attack basically accomplished nothing. We still have 15,000 supplies here. We don't have very many good units here, however. Uh, we have uh, the 11th Indian, 9th Indian divisions, and then we've got the 27th Australian Brigade, are really the only strong units left. Um, but we're at 780 or 744 assault values, so every fort matters there. Fighter unit in Singapore is just a, a fragment of the Blenheim IF. Uh, meanwhile, we've started pulling the 223 group, I think it is, out of uh, Sabang. So we pulled the entire eight, uh, air HQ of the 223 group out of Singapore. We're working on the 224 group. We've got 120 at Sabang, and then we've got about 600, I think it is, at, um, at Meden, as well as elements of the 223 group. Uh, we're also working on getting other elements of the 224 group. Still about 468 of it is left at uh, at Singapore. So we're working on transferring those via air to get those guys out of there. We have started bringing the 223 group into Rangoon. Only a small element made it in this turn. 228 of the 223 group made it into Singapore this turn, into Rangoon this turn. Um, that means we're probably about four or five days from getting the entire 223 group out and, uh, and into Rangoon. But those are important air HQs which allow you to to have torpedoes and stuff on your, your aircraft. Apparently I also have Vildebeest here. Five of them? At Rangoon? A Gim Fulmers, which wouldn't be very useful. Fulmers might not be bad anti-bomber aircraft if I wanted to try and protect transports from getting hit. Otherwise, Swordfish or Albacores would probably be better off. Intel on carrier groups? That's a good, that's a good question. We should check SIGINT. So 2nd Air Division is moving toward Kuatan on the Malay Peninsula. That's a support unit. 3rd Division's at Changsha. Radio Transmission's at Harbin, which I think is in Manchuria. Not a ton of radio uh, SIGINTs this turn. Don't give them naval fighters. Stop considering it or you will find me. Fulmers aren't naval fighters, are they? They're just junk. These guys are going to go to Pegu as well. So we're going to form the 17th Indian Division here before too long. we got to unpack those guys. Yeah, Ewold, it is uh, it is quite the game from a micromanagey sort of control literally everything down to like the squadron level and, and battalion level of, of combat troops. Batavia is up to 58%. They're only making 1% per turn of fortification work. They kind of suck. Meanwhile, uh, we do have our 12 Dutch Hurricanes, and we've got 8 P-40E Warhawks. I've got two more in the pool, but for whatever reason, I can't, uh, can't switch them over yet. Meanwhile, we're starting to build up a few more Hurricanes in reserve as well. Uh, if we get, if we, I think in like a week or so, we might replace these Buffaloes with Hurricanes as well. And maybe we could get like 30 modern aircraft between the P-40s and the, the Hurricanes on Java. That would be a nice surprise for him whenever he does make a move. I don't really have any desire to have 80, 20 aircraft intercept like 30 zeros over, over, uh, the East coast of Java. But, um, you know, maybe if things lighten up there, we'll get a, we'll get an interesting opportunity there. 
train prepare for Molman, Pat? Uh, do I? Nope. Mostly for Pegu. Okay. Is Pegu a naval hex? I don't see any port. If I wanted to run supplies, and I don't want to, but in theory, if I wanted to run supplies into Pegu, could I? It is on the coast, but it has no port. That's interesting. Um, all right, so I think that's kind of the gist of this turn. There's not a ton going on. I know this is, um, it's been the first stream in a while. I actually I shouldn't say there's not a ton going on. There's a lot going on in China. This is the first really interesting turn in, in Burma. So I've got to really make some, I think, key decisions about how we want to handle that. Um, but I don't have a lot else to talk about this turn. Um, we still have our 678 aircraft running supplies into China from India, so that's going on. Uh, still have a bit of logistical work to do, uh, resupplying and, and moving trans, uh, transport groups around and whatnot. Um, why does that air unit have 7,000 fuel? They're loading fuel and going to Canada? No, 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 no. Go to Karachi. Oh, I think those were the guys I was going to pick up the uh, P-40s or the Kitty Hawks out of eastern Canada, but I decided to send them via convoy to South uh, South Africa first. They've got good speed, though. Those are good, good transports. Okay... Submarine attack tactics, uh, Pat. I've mainly used them from for denial of SIA operations. It doesn't seem like XTRG has really set up a lot in the way of convoys yet. We had Sub sitting off Amiri for a little while after he took it, thinking that maybe he'd try and pull a bunch of fuel out of there and bring it to Japan. But there's basically been no convoy activity north of Borneo. We've also seen very little convoy activity in and around the Philippines where we had a string of submarines as well. I get the sense he's waiting till some of the operations in these different areas settle down before he really starts up any, any major convoys. I feel like the one exception might be in the Yellow Sea or in the Sea of Japan, where we have seen some activity between Fusun and the Japanese coast. We've also seen some activity between like the Yellow Sea, might have been Qingtao, might have been Port Arthur, not sure which, uh, and Japan. And I think we saw a convoy or two coming out of Shanghai to Japan, probably bringing resources there. The problem with operating in these areas is our, our torpedoes suck, and especially like off of the southern coast of, uh, of Korea, we've got like one hex to intercept anybody in. So I don't think we're going to be able to operate effectively if he's bringing most of his supplies via rail into Pusan and then just jumping him one hex over. Um, so I'm not really sure. I, I, I don't really know what the best route is in terms of using my subs at this point. It feels like using them against his, his offensive operations might be the best tactic at the moment. We had been, we have a couple of screens on the eastern coast of Java because we assume he's going to land there eventually. Uh, and we did have a bunch of subs operating off Palembang. I think we sank one ship or something like that with them. But I'm not really sure because, again, at this point in time, he hasn't yet taken the major oil facility at Palembang. He hasn't yet taken Singapore. He could do some convoy missions in those areas once those bases fall or off of Java as well. But at the moment, he still has a lot of key bases that he hasn't taken yet, so it doesn't seem like he's really set up his convoys. How do I set up patrol areas? Okay, Pat. What I mean is he's not he hasn't set up large resource or oil convoys pulling those things back to Japan. He's obviously 
uh, supplying some of his forward bases. Although maybe not as much as you would think. Truck starts with like 250,000 fuel. That's enough for a while. Um, I think I saw one convoy heading to Baldabop as well, but it's not a large number of convoys in terms of like economic warfare type convoys. I've been using my, my, my ships are set in patrol modes, so they're not, they're currently set to, uh, to patrol. Why do I have destroyers at Port Moresby? That's weird. I don't remember ordering them there. Wait, no, that's not a destroyer. That's a sub. Still don't remember sending these guys there. Uh, Twenty-seven defensive mines. That's great. We're also using some subs to drop mines at Buna and Lay. I think those work too. By the way, I think we heard some explosions and some uh, ships sinking on his end. Uh, before we end this turn here, let's take a real quick look at. Um, yeah, no, Stein, I agree. By the way, where was that uh, that sub that did all that? The Spearfish. Here she is. Spearfish, you used all your torpedoes up. No Mark 14s left. Used up almost all your deck guns. Uh, 18 ammo, so it looks like you have two ammo left. You're going to need to return to base, buddy. Uh, your skipper is Lieutenant Commander Price. He only has 26 aggression, and yet he did all that? Wow. Maybe I should replace him. That's a pretty ca crappy skipper, actually. That aggression level is way too low. Um, yeah, mines work better than torpedoes. Problem is I just don't have enough mines. A lot of my subs use multiple hex patrols as well. Just depends on where and when and what I'm doing with them. Um, all right. So let's take a look at ship availability. What's coming up soon? Got a tanker at Abaddon tomorrow. We get the Queen Mary in two days in Cape Town. Three days we get the Formidable in Cape Town. So we get another carrier, uh, although not a great one. We get 18 torpedo bombers, I guess. So a bunch of uh, biplanes. And then we get 16 Marlet twos. Are those their fighters? British carrier air wings kind of suck. But in any event, we get another British carrier in three days. Kind of. Well, I mean, they're biplanes. British carrier air wing torpedo bombers are nice. But other than that, their uh, their fighter aircraft suck. They're at least, I mean, the Hurricane's good, but they just don't have large enough air wings to do anything. Um, 17 days till the Oklahoma's ready. So she's almost repaired. Hundred and sixty three for the Pennsylvania. Oh, the Maryland's ready in fourteen days too. So in just a little bit over two weeks we'll have two more battleships ready. So they can sit in port and do nothing. But someday they'll be ready for the counteroffensive. Um do we have anything coming up on withdrawals? Seventy-two days for a troop tri transport to be withdrawn. Air group withdrawals. Twenty-nine days for so we've got two hurricane groups in Mandalay and Rangoon, which have about a month left. Our Catalinas and Penryn need to be pulled out in a little bit over a month. Some of our transports in Lido, and as well as our P-40s and P-39s, about two months out. Honestly, these squadrons will probably be dead in two months anyway, so that won't be disastrous. What's a reserve pool look like? A lot of guys in their 50s. A couple of 70 pluses. We could probably build a pretty solid squadron out of uh, out of these guys. Replacing, uh, maybe moving them into the Flying Tigers and then giving them P-38s.
Yeah, Stein. I don't. I guess I don't know. I don't remember if I don't. Re- I've listened to Shattered S- Sword on Audible. I don't remember if uh, if it was the armored flight decks that forced him to have such small air wings, or if it was British doctrine, or if they just weren't efficient at like cramming more aircraft into their carriers or not. Because like even some of the carriers, like the Indomitable, I think it says it can fit like fifty aircraft or forty five aircraft, but the air wings don't even aren't even that large. Uh, where is she? Indomitable. So she can fit 45 aircraft. They only have 33 mounted. Like, why? Why? Sea hurricanes are sexy, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think that's enough of me rambling. I think we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, episode. Winnow, thanks for uh, following. Uh, Stein and Brass Monkey, thanks for the subs. Uh, JP Cernas, thanks for the follow. And I can't see anybody else, but I think there were one or two other follow-ups that I missed. Um, My screen just doesn't go go down that far. Uh, With that being said, guys, I hope you do uh, enjoy uh, these episodes. Uh, We should be back, hopefully not quite as long, before our next episode. Um, I know, again, I was busy with my office, basically shut down for about a week. But uh, until next time, guys, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for uh, watching. And until next time, I'm out.